are we doing? Hey, welcome home. And I say that to my family too, because we just got back from vacation. So I uh, was watching last week while y'all were doing your thing. And Derek preached. We had a great Sunday last week. Thank you. Uh, let's, uh, let me just give a couple quick announcements. Uh, if you have, if you're new or you have new information, there should be a blue connect card in front of you. Or you can go to our church center app and you can put stuff in there. Uh, and that's a quick way of doing that. Also, two things that I want to tell you about that we do each week. One, on Wednesday night at 530, we have a fellowship meal. Uh, and that's potluck is what, I, what we used to call it. And then we have a time of spending the word after that. And then on Sundays, every age group, we have a 9 a.m. session for, uh, of learning about the word of God and relationships and all of that at 9 a.m. Uh, from zero to you, wherever you are. So, uh, amen. Let's stand. We're going to go into, go, we're going to pray and we're going to go into the word of the uh, worship and we'll move forward here. Father, we just love you today. We thank you for your blessings, for your goodness and your mercy. I ask that you would just move today, touch every heart, draw us closer to you, and receive our worship today as we worship you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.
Can somebody say praise the Lord? Amen. We're so glad you are here today. I'm excited because I want to see what God has all for us today. Right now, it's time for our then offering. What an awesome time that we get to continue to see in our service and also within this uh, worship experience. Let's just pray. God, you're so good and great. There is no other God but you. Lord, we thank you today for everything we have good because it comes from you. And Father, we want to say how much we love you. Lord, how much we want to honor you and to live for you. Lord, in this time of the offerings and tithes, use them all, God, for your glory that we may lift up the name of Jesus. Amen.
song this morning, hopefully, if I can get this guitar to come through. Um, so if you know it, sing it along with us. If not, uh, learn it with us together. A couple parts are really high for me, so if I scream and hurt somebody's ear, sing it the best I can. Mm -hmm. 
glad that's true <laughs> amen my God's bigger stronger he's able to do anything he can take care of all this stuff amen God bless you you can be seated kids are going still going I love it we've um I love it glad they're we had I don't know 
16 or something kids a couple Sundays ago in back there. So, great time last week. Derek did a great job. He always does. Thankful for that. And appreciate uh, everything y'all are doing. God's doing some great things, and uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. Let's, let's go into the Word of the Lord today. I want to look, if you're looking in your, uh, in your phones, if you're looking in your Bible, we'll look at Luke chapter 17. But I, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but it seems as though it's more so than ever before. People are desperate for hope. They just want answers. They just want a kind word. They just want someone to tell them that it's going to be okay. Um, I heard a commercial, and you can be on whichever, you can be blue or red, and I'll still love you. But I heard a commercial that said, we want to, fight for America that you can have one job and be able to take care of your family. Um, I'm just glad that Murphy's oil got their gas going again so gas would come down and they'd fight for a little while on 54. They dropped like 30 cents when Walmart opened back up with their gas. I told Dana two weeks ago to stop buying blueberries. Because they're too expensive. Hope that something's going to be different, that something's going to change. Let me share with you this statement. There is an answer for all the hope problems in this world. His name is Jesus. know if y'all figured this out or not but it really in the end doesn't matter who's in any of those chairs in Washington what matters is who's on the chair above that right so Luke 17 we got several verses you can remain seated if you want to stand for the word of God you can but I got 16 17 verses I'm gonna read so I'm gonna go I'm gonna hit them fast When he was asked, verse number 20, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with something observable. No one will say, see here or there, for you see the kingdom of God is in your midst. Then he told the disciples, the days are coming when you will long to see one of the days of the Son of Man, but you won't see it. And they will say to you, see there or see here? Don't follow or run after them, for as the lightning flashes from horizon to horizon, lights up the sky, so the Son of Man will be in his day. But first it is necessary that he suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. Just as it was as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People went on eating, drinking, marrying, being given in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. It will be the same as in the days of Lot. People went on eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be like that on the day the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, a man on the housetop whose belongings are in the house must not come down to get them. Likewise, the man who is in the field must not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to make his life secure will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, two will be in one bed. One will be taken, and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken, and the other left. Where, Lord, they asked him, he said to them, where the corpse is, there also the vultures will be gathered. So now, for some of you, that seemed a little bit dark. We, anytime we start talking about vultures, we start talking about two in the bed and one going to stay and one's leaving. Sorry, Dana. What I should have said is, shucks. 
we all know if there's only one going, we know who that is. But this is a, 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 an eschological text about the end times, living in crazy times. We are, we're living in a, a times of, uh, we got pandemics, and then they're, they keep modifying this crazy pandemic and making it even stronger. And we got wars, and they keep manufacturing wars and economic instabilities. The world is tipped upside down. But let me help you for a minute. You don't have to go following every rabbit trail as you go. I'm going to save you lots of hours in study of looking at the book of Daniel and looking at the book of Revelation and this verse we just read and throughout the gospel. I'm going to just sum up my theology here on the end time real quick. Nobody knows. Now, there's things we can know, but nobody really knows. We live as if it's going to happen tomorrow. And we prepare as if it's going to happen for in the next generation. So much fear, heartache, pain, instability in the world, but as followers of Jesus, we don't need to lose our mind just because everyone around us is. So Jesus is talking about the twofold nature of the kingdom of God. Everybody say the kingdom of God. It's the already and the not yet. So you got to understand when he starts talking about the kingdom of God, you got to know which nature that he is talking about. The already is the realized nature of God's kingdom, which was in verse 21. The kingdom is in your midst, he said, because of Jesus coming and being there in the flesh. And the not yet, it's not yet fully realized. We know because there's still sin in the world. There's still human trafficking. There's still injustice. There's still death. There's still sickness. There's still war. There's still famine. I've got a t-shirt that I wear that's got a picture of, um, she's actually an Indian girl, a young child, and it's got barbed wire on her, and at the cross, the bottom of that, it says abolish. I wore that about a couple of months ago, longer than that now. We cleaned out a, a, a trailer over here, and we used uh, we had a big a dumpster and stuff, and I wore that shirt that day. And it's a pretty stark, pretty harsh, pretty in-your-face shirt. I had zero people talk to me about that shirt. <laughs> now, I said something afterwards to somebody. They said, I didn't even see that. They, they were doing their thing. They were focused. They were whatever. So, it's cool. But uh, it's, we realize that we are in the not yet also. Because there still are these things going on in the world. A day is coming when Jesus will return and all these things will be made new. Somebody say new. No more pain. No more suffering. No more diseases. In the middle of our text of this end time, if you noticed, I emphasized three words. I paused and emphasized on those. Jesus drops these three seemingly insignificant words. Somebody read the screen for me. Remember Lot's wife. Here he is talking about the kingdom of the, uh, the already and the not yet and what's going to happen and this is happening and, and famines and two in the bend and this and that, all this stuff. And he goes, remember Lot's wife. It seems random. For those of you that know, I went through the scripture. I read the whole scripture this year, this week, and I counted every single woman that was mentioned. Parable, Gary. He caught that one. He didn't need the help. That was not. That might have been a parable, but that might have been a lie. I didn't. It's called Google, and it's called a computer. There are 170 men, women alluded to in scripture. But there's only one woman that Jesus ever tells us to remember. Now, the woman that poured out the alabaster box and what, he said her deed would remember, but she, he never said remember her. Jesus tells us to remember Lot's wife. And it's in the context of speaking about the end times. Say the end times. Say remember Lot's wife. He didn't tell us to remember Eve. What was significant about Eve? 
She's your mama. You ought to know that. That's significant. If she wasn't here, you wouldn't be. Okay? Just saying. So you would think that'd be one we'd remember. What about Sarah? She had a kid when she was 90 years old. How many of you want to sign up for that one? <laughs> I ain't even sure I want great grandkids at 90. You know, anyway, I'm sorry, anyway. What about Mary? His own mother didn't even say, remember her. But the nameless woman appearing on the pages of Scripture only quick enough to disappear. And we don't even know her name. What do we know? If we got to remember her, what do we know about her? Genesis 13, 12 and 13 says, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Lot set up camp at Sodom. If you, if you really understand the, the passage of time of Scripture, he was in the valley, and he slowly made his tent closer and closer. And then it says he was in the doorstep. He was in the gate. And then it says he was inside the city. Um, let me just, just briefly make a little commercial right here. It matters which way your nose, your nose is pointed. It matters where you're looking because the things we look at are the things that we go toward. He pitched his tent, the scripture says, toward Sodom. Every day he saw Sodom. The thing that he was looking for was Sodom. And he began to get closer, 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 closer until he was there in the middle of that city. But Lot sets up camp in the valley there of Sodom at the time that he and Abraham separated and went their different ways. Did he meet his wife there? Did he already have a wife? Did he meet his wife there? Did, we don't know. We do know that God had given Sodom a whole lot of mercy, many opportunities to repent, and then God decided that that time was over. And so we've always associated immorality with Sodom. We highlight various sins, but here's what Ezekiel says about the greatest sin of Sodom, Ezekiel chapter 16. Now this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, plenty of food, and comfortable security. That sounds like America. Oh wait, sorry. That sounds like England. You can say amen now. That sounds like Canada. That sounds like Tennessee, not Kentucky. That sounds like Bowling Green, not Owensboro. But didn't support the poor and the needy. They were haughty and did detestable acts before me. So I removed them when I saw this. In our pride and comfortable security, do we still care about a lost world? Well, that was a real question. Do we still care about the injustices in the world? Do we care about the poor? Do we care about the needy? Do you know the scripture says in Proverbs that whosoever giveth to the poor will never lack? Just rip that page out. I don't want that. We need to think about how many are still out there waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. You, you, again, I'm in this business, so I'm, I'm, you understand how traditionally ineffective it is to go set up a building in a town and then put a sign out and say, I'm over here, come see me. I got what you need. We do it all the time. It's called churches. I want to evangelize the world, so I go to a town, rent a building, and put here I am, come see me, how great it is.
Yet the scripture says that we're supposed to go to the highways and the byways and to compel them. Not just hand them a flyer. We, we hand out our share. I just, but it says to compel them. Should we consider for just a moment how many there are that are still out there? God cares about the poor and the needy. God cares about us living a life on mission. He cares about our personal holiness and righteousness, absolutely. It all matters to God. And although the scripture says that God was done with Sodom and Gomorrah, he wasn't done with Lot and his wife and their two daughters. He still had a plan. He still had a purpose. He still had promises for them in their future. There are times when certain things in our lives are over. But the purposes of God in our lives are never over. We call those things, we call those closing of one door and seeing another door open, right? We've talked about that a lot. The promise of God is never over. The provision of God is never over. In Genesis 19, the scripture tells us that, that two angels came to rescue Lot and his family, taking them by the hand. And as they brought them out, one said, escape for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the hills lest you be swept away. Hear me for just a minute. Just let you inside my brain for just a moment. If my life as I knew it was burning down around me and I'm leaving everything I know and I'm literally being drugged out by an angel holding my hand, and he speaks to me, I'm going to listen to what he said and listen to this, baby. I'm going to do it exactly what he says to do. If he says hop on one foot backwards until you roll over and do, then do two somersaults and then jump up and run, I'm going to hop on one foot backwards until I fall over, do two somersaults, and then run. I'm not doing three somersaults. I'm not hopping forwards because it's just good enough. I'm going to do exactly, anybody know what I'm saying? I'm going to do exactly what this stuff is, this place is burning down. I got an angel ripping me out of the place and giving me a word telling me what to do. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But this is the only thing we know about Lot's wife. Genesis 19 to 26. But Lot's wife, behind him, looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. I believe it's the King James says, looking back from behind. And the translation of that was, she was lingering. She did the one thing that she was told not to do. In the Hebrew, that word actually means lingering or longing. You see, she wasn't just looking back with her eyes. Her heart wanted to go back to the thing that God was finished with. That is where we're going today. Remember Lot's wife. She got calcified and stuck in a place she was only meant to be passing through. Somebody might ought to take a picture of that one. Oh, for those of you who don't know, you got a little... Most of you have a QR code in front of you. You can follow all my notes there and you can just. She got calcified and stuck in a place where she was only meant to be passing through. This world is not my home. I'm.
I'm just a passing through. Her, she prioritized her past over her future. She wanted what she was leaving more than what God had for her in the future. She ended up getting stuck, stopping, destroying her life and her daughter's lives as well because she wasn't there for them. She ended up getting stuck on the way. She wasn't at either place. She wasn't where she was, and she wasn't where she's supposed to be. But in the meanwhile, remember the story of the ten virgins? The scripture says they all slumbered and slept. In the meanwhile, in the time between, she got calcified about yesterday and got stuck. When you get stuck, it has implications for the generations after you. It doesn't only affect your life. When you get stuck in the things of yesterday, when you get stuck in the things and the traditions of yesterday, and they're not they're not the things of tomorrow. Let me let me let me say it this way. Traditions and scripture aren't always the same thing. Even traditions based in scripture still aren't scripture because they weren't a tradition one day. One day they were new. That, does that make, make sense? They became a tradition over time. But one day they were new. But the scripture never changed. So I propose to you that there's things that are, I'm not talking about changing scripture, I'm not talking, talking about changing theology and doctrine. I'm talking about changing some things that there are, in, that God brings to us. Elijah has a word from the Lord, a scripture from the Lord. He walks in the king's room, king's throne room, walks into Ahab's house. He said, hey, 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 cat. It ain't going to rain till I say it's going to rain. Deuces, I'm out. And leaves. There's nothing in scripture that says that God called Elijah to be a prophet. It just says Elijah walked in and prophesied. I'm not saying God didn't call him. I'm saying he walked in. He, there's no announcement. He just shows up and said, it's not going to rain till I say it's going to rain and left. One of the things he did is God told him, go to the brook, I believe Kebron, but I apologize if it's not the right one. Go to the brook and I will water you there and I'll have a raven come feed you. The word of the Lord said, go to the brook. He went there, he drank water and raven brought him food. One day he woke up and the water was dry and there was no raven. What are we going to do now, God? I have prepared a widow for you. But wait, I have a word from you that says this is my brook. We're going to change the name of this brook to Elijah's brook. And I have a pet raven that keeps bringing me food. I think I'll just wait a little longer. Maybe the water will start flowing again. He had a tradition that was no longer viable in the new season. The new season said there's a widow that's going to take care of you because she needs your help and you need her help. Because we weren't supposed to do this alone, Jack. So he had to adjust the word of the Lord that he had was completed. Because you see, we've got to live out of every proceeding word from the Lord, not the preceding word. There's a difference in a preceding word and a proceeding word. Context, context of, of language, right? He said, I've got a proceeding word from you. Elijah said, I got a preceding word that exceeds. No, it doesn't. The proceeding word is now. You need the now word of God. And the now word is you got to go over here. What I'm trying to tell you is that we have a generation of believers now that's feeling stuck, wishing for what was. People wishing things would go back 
to normal. Hear me. Things have changed. That normal will never be here again. We can't go back. It's not going to happen. But Hebrews 16, 6 and 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Hebrews 13 and 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's a great verse. That is not my verse. Although everything around us has changed, I'm not diminishing in, in any of that stuff, but ultimately for us as Jesus followers, nothing has changed. He told us to not love this world anyway. He told us that this world, we're just, we're just, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm using songs in my head now, not scriptures. We're just a band of weary pilgrims. We're just, we're just traveling through the land. This is not our home. This is just a stop along the way. And yet we've gotten comfortable enough that we've bought brick homes. Yeah, hello? And we've established ourselves. We didn't just establish and do a, do a garden. We planted orchards. We planted on being here a while. Ultimately, nothing has changed because Jesus is our hope. Our hope's not our garden or our orchard or our job. Our hope is Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. For the promises of God in him are yes and amen. Jesus is our hope. Things change, but Jesus is the hope that we have. So many have been stuck in instability, in divisiveness, in chaos. There's so many people that love offense. Know anybody like that? Don't point at your neighbor. That was not, that was not kind. Unforgiveness, bitterness, disappointment, discouragement, disillusionment, stuck in a place we were only meant to pass through. The world is shifting, but we were born for this moment in history. I came to that understanding about 30, 35 years ago that I was like, man, I wish I could have been there and fought alongside of King David. Well, maybe I could have just been King David. Or I wish I could have been there with the apostles and I could have been the first one to share the good news, the new good news with the world. And then I realized that that wasn't what God's plan was for me. God's plan was for me to be alive right now, to share the gospel now. This is our place in history. This do you understand how important it is? If you believe that this is the end time, if you believe that we are getting very close to Jesus returning, do you understand we as the church, he has chosen us to be the ones that bring end time revival to this world today? He didn't choose the Apostle Paul. He didn't choose King David. He didn't choose Elijah. He didn't choose Peter. Stand up on the day of Pentecost. He didn't choose that. He chose us. Now that's a great, great privilege and a great honor. And it should be humbling also to understand this is our moment and God chose us for this moment. You see, God chooses the times, places, and season that he puts everyone in. Before I formed you, I knew you, right? That's what he said to Jeremiah. Before I, knew, before I formed you, I knew you, and I chose to put you here then. Right there, pow, there. Same thing with all of us. He knew us before we were ever formed, and he chose the time that we were going to drop into. We are not a product of the time. We're a product of eternity. Placed in time. God has positioned us here, filled us with his spirit, and told us to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's our job profile. That's not changed. Even with such a political and economic instability, with wars and divisions and changing views of morality, yes, our job profile still has not changed. 
The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living inside of us. Say me. Say me. That power lives in me. Say that power lives in me. Romans says, for if that spirit that raised quite Christ from the dead dwell in you, it shall also quicken your mortal body. We, therefore, we can do what Philippians 4 and 13 says, is we can do all things through Christ who. We don't have to get stuck looking back, longing for the past, longing for yesterday. Hear me for just a minute. Uh, there's, a, there's, some, uh, there's some cabinets in the office in there, uh, in, the, in the church office, and there's, we, got, we got cabinets. And we got stuff. We got, I was just last week or two weeks ago, I was in there and there was a, the plans of the original building of the sanctuary was sitting there. And I was looking at it and I was doing this. And it, it said this many sits here and then this many in the choir loft. And I was like, we're the choir loft. Things have changed. And then I even saw, I saw some directories and saw some pictures of different things. And I saw pictures of people. And for us to want... The Lewis Lane of 1979. I want to do this as kindly as I can. That's silly. That's that's not that's not good thought. Because today's not 1979. We good? You understand? We had to do some things differently along the way, and we got to continue to do some things differently along the way. Remember those two disciples going to Ephesus? I'm sorry, going to Emmaus? Remember them? They were so disappointed because the Scripture says that they thought Jesus was the one. And they didn't know that he was resurrected yet. And so Jesus turns up, walks with them, and they still don't even recognize him. They get a little heartburn, but they thought it was the tacos. They lost sight of the fact that God was actually standing in their midst because of their disappointment. Because of what happened yesterday, they couldn't recognize God today. Because of the pain of yesterday, they weren't able to see the miracle of today. Does that make sense? Have we lost sight? of the fact that Jesus is actually with us? Luke 24 and 21 says, but we had hoped that he was the one. You see, I hoped that my business would succeed. I hoped that that marriage would last. I had hoped my kids would be living for the Lord by now. I had hoped that that ministry opportunity was going to open up. God reveals to us where our misplaced hopes are. Those things cannot give us what we need. We've been trying to get them from people and things, what we can only get from God. And then we get disappointed when they don't deliver. We've been trying to get from people and things what we can only get from God, and then we get dis disappointed when they don't deliver. Idols never deliver. Idols will always disappoint. Hebrews 12 and 27, so that those things that cannot be shaken will remain. The bottom of that verse, those things that cannot be shaken will remain. We had a song. I don't, Bob, I might get you. I hope I get you on this one. I've never gotten Bob on a song here. So uh, it was, we had one that we sang that uh, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be. Does that, you know that? Oh. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. If you can be shaken in this day and age, it's going to happen. But you better make sure that your hope 
is in Jesus because your hope in Jesus will carry you and keep you strong. That's the thing that has remained. Jesus Christ is sovereign. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. There is no other way. Sorry, there's no other way. He's kind. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's loving. He's not in a bad mood. He loves you. He's happy. He's glad that you came today. He's glad that you're here. He, your picture is on his refrigerator. You're his favorite. And then Jesus asked you this, am I enough? Then Jesus asked the question, am I enough, church? Am I enough for you? Or do you need to go somewhere else? Do you need to go looking for something else? Is there more in that you need? Or am I enough? Stop looking back at what was and start fixing your eyes on Jesus. Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor things for uh, in heaven and things beneath heaven and, 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 and all, all these things. And he said, and things present nor things to come. Today and tomorrow, what's not listed? Yesterday. These things can't separate you from the love of God, but he did not say that your past can't separate you. Because if you live in your past, you will miss your future. I want to tell you this one real quickly. I don't think I've ever told you this story. If I have, smile and act like it's brand new. Missionary, Madagascar, Malay, Malawi, South Africa over there. He went to a, uh, a service one night that a witch doctor was conducting. He sat on the back row. Uh, I can tell you his name if you want me to. Not the witch doctors. He's insignificant in this story. The missionary. So he's, this witch doctor is walking around telling people about their past. And, and what, what modern day, we would call that prophesying, telling them about their past and whatever. The difference was he gave them no hope for the future. He was just telling them about their past. And he would walk through and he'd walk around and he'd lock eyes with this missionary. And then he'd go on to someone else. He did that about four or five times. Finally, he said, sir, would you stand? And had him stand up and he said, I've, 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 I've locked eyes with you several times here, but I don't know what's going on with you. Who are you? You don't have a past. He said, Jack, your service is over. Mine just began, and I began to tell them about Jesus and the fact that the blood washes away our past, and we are no longer held by those things. Now we have a today and a tomorrow. So God still has a plan for these things in your life. Just fix your eyes forward. Not diminishing or denying pain and loss and all that in your life. Please understand that. But just make sure that Jesus, make what Jesus has done for us bigger than what anyone has done to us. Make what Jesus has done for us bigger than what anyone has said about us. It's amazing what can throw us off our game. Your history does not define your destiny. And somebody ought to say amen to that. Somebody ought to say thank you, Jesus, to that. What happened at Calvary was greater than what anyone else has done to me or whatever I've done to myself. The most powerful force on the planet is the blood of Jesus Christ. The most powerful force on the planet is the blood of Jesus Christ. It sets people free. And Jesus is still setting people free, delivering, healing today. Somebody say today. I'm really trying to, to, to finish this uh, quickly, but uh, give me... I'm probably going to take five more minutes. Give me five more minutes. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, people returned to the land to find it decimated. 
Jerusalem was a mess. The people of Israel were physical prisoners in Babylon. And they went back home and Zechariah said now they needed to be prisoners of hope. A conversation this week with someone who was discussing the fact, you know what, I'm, 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 I, things haven't worked out. If I really was plain, I'd probably just say I'm mad at God. And as I began to process that, and even a days after that, I realized that this is, the, this, this, this is my problem. I'm a prisoner of hope. I have chosen to live a life that believes God's going to take care of me. This is why we don't need to look back. We fix our eyes on Jesus. God is drawing us to our future. How can we be full of hope? Started this whole message with one thing. The answer to the hope problem in the world is Jesus. That's how we can be full of hope, is Jesus. Furthermore, if Jesus is living inside of me, We're not ignorant of the reality of pain and suffering on the earth, but there is a longing for what will be. Jesus is going to come back and make all these things new, and the wrong things will be right. Paul wrote to the Philippians from a prison cell. His situation wasn't getting any better, but his revelation of Jesus is getting greater. In Philippians 3 and 13 and 14, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own, but one thing I do, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's three things you're going to have to do to be a prisoner of hope and to live this way. One, you're going to have to be forgetting. Some have been stuck for years, and this is going to be a defining moment. The blood of Jesus does not give us amnesia, but it gives me a life beyond my past. You don't have to be defined by your greatest failure or your greatest mistake or what has been done to you. You've got to let some things go. To be a great Christian, you're going to have to get a great get over it spirit. Offense, bitterness, disappointment. What God's got ahead of you is so much greater. You'll miss it if you stay calcified in a moment that you should have been passing through. Two, straining. Paul said, have we as the church forgotten to strain? Paul was talking about pressing in, straining in to what's going on. Straining. Have we forgotten how to strain? It's going to hurt a little bit. It's time to exercise those faith muscles again It's time to get moving. One of the things my brother and I talk about all the time when it comes to weightlifting and and exercise and all these things is don't stop. Don't stop. When we were growing up, we had a guy that played NBA basketball and he was an athletic director at the county school. Uh, He would run. He ran about 10 miles a day. He ran through everybody's neighborhood. Russellville's not very big. He ran through everybody's neighborhood. Uh, Bob Milan, he would run and run and run. And they asked him one day, they said, you want to play ball? You want to play ball with us, Bob? He said, no, no, no. My ball days are over. He's 50, 55 years old, about six foot eight, running. And he said, but I keep moving. So why are you running if you're not going to play ball? He said, because I'm never going to stop. If you ever stop, that's when things start tightening up. That's when things start doing this. Start to think, just keep pressing on. Just keep straining. And the last one is to press on. The Greek word press in this instant actually means to exert a steady force against move beyond the pain I know you were hurt press on move beyond the pain exert a steady force against complacency lethargy apathy indifference entitlement unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, lust, greed, envy, gossip, slander. Did I hit yours? I know y'all know this. 
Y'all, I have exampled this in front of you, and today I stand here as a witness of it. I am one of the most patient people you will ever meet. Yeah, it's not me. I just other people got that gift. I got other stuff, so it's cool. Not patient. How many of you have ever walked up to an elevator and there's someone already standing there? And you have to look around to see if the button's been pressed. Anybody? Or y'all, some of y'all just walk up and you're just. Now, Dana does not care. She doesn't care if that button's been pressed or not as long as I'm with her. Because she don't need to care about it because I got it. It will. And so it's amazing. I've walked up and walked up and there's this couple standing there. They're complaining that the elevator's taking too long. She's like grabbing my hand and squeezing. And they're complaining. They had never pushed the button. What is this? Magic? Who are you, David Copperfield? You got to push the button. You can pray all you want. But he's already given you the answer, and the answer is the button. I propose to you, I believe some of you are standing in front of the elevator today, waiting for your next. You're going to have to push the button for the doors to open. He's not going to push you into it. He's going to give you the opportunity to make that decision on your own. So I say to you today, it's time to press the button and get moving into the purpose and promises that God has for you. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me, please? Can we all just close our eyes? I don't want to rush through this moment, but I am going to be uh, cognizant of what we're doing here. Let me ask you this question. Everyone just close your eyes for just a moment if you would. If you feel like you're standing in front of an elevator waiting for it to open because of what your next is, would you just lift your hand? You know there's a next in your life. Yeah, there you go. Hands all over the room. Thank you. Thank you. Some things, you can put them down. Thank you. Some things in our life, he's waiting on us. Oh, he's got great plans for us on the other side of those elevator doors. He's going he's gonna to take you to another level. But you're going to have to push the button. You're going to have to push the call button and ask for the elevator to come. And I'm going to pray for you right now that that will happen. Father, you saw every hand that's raised. Today, I pray that they would push that button. That they would take that step. That they would be there ready to move into their purpose and the plan that you have for them right now. I pray your blessings over their life. I pray courage over them right now. Boldness in Jesus' name to take that step. Uh, Maybe it's in leading their family. Maybe it's in, in, in pressing into something else that you have for them. Maybe it's ministry. Whatever it is, God, I pray that you would just do that now. Give them that boldness now in Jesus' name. As you remain with your eyes closed, if you've never given your heart to the Lord, I want to give you that opportunity right now. That may be the elevator button you need to push. Is I, need to, I need to make things right. I need to live for Jesus. If you've never done that, I want to help you. I want to pray with you. Just lift your hand. Just lift your hand. I want to make Jesus first in my life. I want to give my heart to him. Anyone? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Just as you have your eyes closed, I want us all to pray together. 
I'm going to pray out loud. I want you to pray out loud. I want you to understand this. I'm going to say the words, but you've got to put the meaning behind the words. Jesus, I love you. Thank you for dying for my sins. I ask that you forgive me of all of my sins. I pray that you would let me live for you. Be your child. Walk in the purpose you have as you saved me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you rejoice over that right now? We're going to sing a song. I'm going to come down front. Frank and I will be here if you want prayer. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we want to talk to you. If you don't want to come down right now, we'll talk to you afterwards. But we want to, we want to walk with you. We want to be with you as you make these steps and as you walk forward with the Lord. If you need prayer, we'd love to pray with you as we sing now in Jesus' name. the biggest things one of the best way that the enemy will try to try to let us see attack me is he is on my past man if he can hammer me with my past and tear me down he will try it every day and every time but because I know of in whose I am and in who I am let's see I have that uh, victory over that if uh, you don't have that today, I'm going to ask you not to leave this room without coming to know that the Lord is your Savior. We are so glad to have you here today. Amen. As I look around this room, you know, I see my family, and it's uh, your family too. We then uh, walk together. And we are so then glad to then have you here today. Let me do just a little bit of housekeeping if I can with you. Uh, man, uh, like if I can have you to remember uh, that our uh, nacho night uh, day has been moved. So be sure you have one of these then a yellow cards. Then also our then a phone team, uh, please remember you four ladies. We're going to then uh, meet for just a few then a, a few then a moments. Let's see, after this worship experience today. First time guest. Everybody in the room. You guys too, on Welcome home. Welcome home. So glad you're here. Let's just pray. God, as I hear this song running through my heart and my head, I do thank you for the uh, your then uh, goodness. Everything good I have, I've already shared earlier in this worship experience, comes from you. And these these then uh, folks in this room are a part of that goodness from you, Father. I pray, f Lord, in every heart, Lord, in this church, in this family of faith, that we are one in the mind and in spirit. Always looking to you, Lord, to walk with you, to run with you as we've heard today. Lord, as we leave this place, let us live out your holy word that others would see your son in us. 
we thank you for the victory that we have in him. And everyone said, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you Wednesday night, all right?